Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 473. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenda. It's January the 11th, and I'm getting used to the idea it's 2019. It is January 11th, and it is 2019. <laughs> I'm not used to the idea yet, Gavin. <laughs> Okay, welcome to another show. Before we begin, this is your audience participation. Before you have an opinion or a bias about how bad or good this show is, I want you to like it. This is this is you being faithful to the show. You, you just you're gonna click I like it. So go to Facebook, go to YouTube, wherever that little thumbs thing is, click like. If you've not subscribed yet, you need to subscribe to the show. You click on that little red button on YouTube and the bell next to it, you'll get instant notifications about the next show. We have a lot of comments going on. Apparently we're not wrong, but there's a lots of things to talk about. And we appreciate you going to YouTube and commenting on the show. And finally, for you guys who want to not see our ugly faces in the morning, and I completely understand, I have to look in the mirror, I know what you're seeing. We have a podcast, so you can just listen to the audio. And uh, you can find that in the show notes. Gavin, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Kevin. I'm exceptionally well. I, I, I'm dropping everything today, but but wonderfully, things have not broken terminally. So they, they, yeah. I'm dropping them, dancing them. I hear, I hear you're visiting France. Yes, I'm, I'm in France. I'm, I'm lighting the fires, driving away the hornets, uh, dry, drying out the, the uh, drying it out. And uh, <laughs> there, there we are. Yes. Well, you. you're, you're the only person I know who goes to France and shaves off their goatee. You're, that's the place you go to grow the goatee, you get nice and thick, and uh, add a little cognac to it. You, you didn't do that this time. Always be always be countercultural, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> Especially in France. Good thinking. People can now see why I wear a goatee beard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, listen, I, I am the keeper of four chins, but you'll never know. <laughs> well, I, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about the news. There's lots of news going on, uh, certainly in the Church of England. Um, and it's going to be fun to talk about because we're going to talk about the Diocese of Oxford. And if you guys have read on Anglican.inc, the uh, that famous website out there that gives you all the news, um, there was a letter from the clergy to the bishops. There's four bishops there, and the bishops have been uh, leading a listing charge, and uh, we are hearing you charge in regards to sexuality and uh, what the church can do and say about sexuality. And uh, these 100 clergy are a little concerned, and I thought you and I could discuss, um, uh, there's lots of different headlines here, but one of them is uh, chaos uh, in Oxford. And I thought you and I could uh, certainly discuss uh, the meltdown that's going on and what's happening. One of the ways we can look at this, I think, is to go back to the time when Dr. Geoffrey John was nominated to be, to be a bishop. And in those days, the uh, people Wait, who, Which is only about 10 years ago. Yeah, not very long. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Bishop Harry, Richard Harris. And in those days, uh, many of the large uh, biblical churches in Oxford says, if you do this, we'll withhold our money. We, there'll be, there really will be very serious trouble indeed. So serious that although Richard Harris was a very determined man and a very, uh, in many ways, a very directive and authoritarian bishop, he, he was frightened off because in the end, Money is the thing that changes minds in the Church of England more, apparently, than anything else. So now, we have to give all credit to these 100 clergy. They're 100 out of 600 parishes, so it's a very big diocese, and they've written saying, we are concerned about the direction that you're taking the Church. Now, there are two problems with this. First of all, there is no, there's no bite to their concern. They don't say, and if you go any further, or if you don't come back we will turn the taps off. That will gain the attention. Uh, and the second problem is, um, I'm, I'm reminded of the, the analogy of a ferry. Um, but, but first of all, what is the response, before I get to the ferry, what is the response of the bishops? They have said, we're very pleased to have this letter from you because you are communicating with us and we want to tell you we're listening. It's a bit like Fraser Craig, really. It's the Church of England's version of Fraser. So, so hi, say the bishops, we're listening. And then, uh, it's not only that they're listening, we hear you. Oh, we hear you, absolutely. 
the... We hear you loud and clear. We hear you have a concern with the direction we're traveling and, and, and you know we want you to hear that we hear you because we do communication. And what pleases us no end about this is we're communicating because you're speaking, we're listening and we're hearing. Isn't this great? The church is functioning as it should do. Now, the, the, the problem with the direction issue is when you, when you cross the channel, you get on a ferry and then, uh, <clears throat> then, then the ferry sets off. And sooner or later, about six hours later in my case, it arrives on the other side. And, and the analogy that came to my mind is here are these 100 splendid clergymen and no doubt women. And I, I think the in-between has belonged to the other side, if you'll forgive me being humorous. No, right. men and women. And, and they say to, the, to the, 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 the captain and crew of the ferry, we're not at all sure we want to go to your destination. <clears throat> and the captain and crew start the boat and off it chunks across the channel. And the conversation then takes place between the faithful biblical passengers and the captain and the crew. And the biblical passengers say, we don't really want to end up the other side. And the crew and the captain say, we hear you. We're listening. And six hours later, they end up on the other side. Now, the, the reason this matters is because there's nothing stopping the Church of England. There's no repentance, no turning around, no second thoughts, all, all the kinetic energy is in favor of this direction and they will land on the other side so what does the other side look like one of the things that has moved me you know, th you know things really strike you sometimes during the day you get an email you get a story from a friend and it it stays with you a while and um i had one of those uh, yesterday and a friend of mine who's a vicar in durham wrote and said i've had to hire a car i went to the hire company and they gave me a car with a rainbow flag on the keys and all the, so the paperwork said, we, we strongly support LGBT, equal rights, diversity, inclusion, the whole, the whole mantra. And he said, there wasn't any point in my complaining. But the next time I go to this company, what I expect is that I'll be invited to tick a box saying, I too, as the customer, support LGBT, inclusive rights. And that if I don't do that, I may not be eligible to do business with this company. Uh, and I think he's exactly right. The, and the problem is that the other side in this is actually the enemy of Christianity. Um, in, in the readings in the lecturing this morning, we had a wonderful letter from 2 John. And uh, we, I, we've been, in my morning prayers, we've been thinking a little bit about what love means. And I had forgotten how well the Apostle John describes love. He simply says, love is this. It's walking in the commandments of the Lord. There is no ambiguity about what the commandments of the Lord are in terms of sexual identity and sexual behavior. That's what love is. It isn't what the Church of England says it is. And so the problem for those who disagree is if they don't find some traction, if there is no sanction attached to it, they'll end up on the other side. And in this case, it's not the other side of the channel. It is the enemy of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, the other side seems to be wicked. Um, is the best way I can uh, put it because here in America we uh, certainly have um, news that breaks out every once in a while of people who decide that they're going to take a stand and not actively support um, a gay wedding or something like that and they have their business uh, sued. Uh, we have uh, Jack Phillips, I think that's his name, in uh, Colorado who uh, won a court case uh, but lo and behold, that was for uh, gay and lesbian weddings. The transgenders are now suing him this month. And uh, it just, there doesn't seem to be an end once you cross over to the other side. And like you were saying there, it's an argument with the captain. It may be the Titanic. You're going too fast. There's icebergs around. I hear you. No, 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 you but you understand, this is the Titanic. We can handle it. Now, you're either going to argue with him before the iceberg or after the iceberg. And uh, I, th I think the failure here is thinking that at the very end, uh, there'll be some repentance after you tell the, uh, the Church of England, hey, we told you so. No, they're happy where they are. <clears throat> they are happy where they are. They, they, I think they're serving a different master. There is a, a new crisis at the University of Oxford where there's a historian. Uh, I think he's called Professor Fiddis, but, yeah. but um, I should have looked it up. Uh, he's, a, he's an eminent historian. He's been there a long time, and he's a practicing Roman Catholic. 
uh, in, over the last 20 years, he's written saying the problem with homosexuality is that it doesn't, it doesn't work and, and that much of our civilization feels it's a deviation that uh, is problematic. And he quotes, uh, he quotes Plato and Aristotle and Virgil. Now, in fact, Plato, um, Plato is very familiar with, with Greek pedophilia and Greek homosexuality. He writes quite a lot about it. He describes it. But he's also very clear that, that as a way of building a society, it is, it is both sterile and immoral. Uh, and so the, 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 the significant classical voices in philosophy and history and literature say this is not the way to build a society. What Plato says is that the problem with practitioners of homosexuality is that they give way, they make pleasure their first virtue and they give way to pleasure too much. And if you have a society that gives way to pleasure, it won't develop the virtues that it needs to to survive. And although we dress this up as love, it's really about pleasure. It's about sexual intimacy. Um, and is this masked by the fact that we misuse our word love. Now, he, this poor, this poor, this, this eminent Oxford historian, of course, is facing calls for a dismissal by colleagues and students who are lining up to sign petitions to get rid of him. He might survive, he might not survive. But the problem is that the other side is one where um, the freedom of speech uh, is absolutely... Uh, the other side is one where, the, where they are attacking the freedom of speech. Sorry, the reason I stopped there was because I had another thought. <laughs> no, no, and, <laughs> the show is about our thoughts. What's your other thought? Well, the other thought was I got an email this morning from... Uh, from a, a man who's a well-known prophetic figure in Protestant circles in England. Uh, and he wrote to me saying, Gavin, I've been praying, and the Lord has been telling me that we're in, really in trouble over Brexit because the EU is not on the right side. And actually, I think he's right. This isn't just a matter of politics. The EU 10 years ago did its very best to create a constitution that wiped Christianity out of its own history and self-understanding. So the EU has not been friendly Christianity and, and shows no sign of it and is of course promoting all these values itself. However, he wrote to me saying, you're a public figure and you are related to GAFCON. Will you please explain why GAFCON is not speaking out loudly in the way that you are? And I wrote back to him and said, well, I, I do admire GAFCON greatly and I have a, a real mutuality with my friends who are part of it and I believe in what they're doing. I'm a complete supporter, but I'm not recognized by them. And therefore, I do speak about this, but you'll have to ask them why they don't. And I think, the, 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 no, but I also wrote it saying, there's a very strong convention that Christians don't get involved in political positions. Be because a Christian ought normally, you can imagine Christians who love these for psychological, political, philosophical, cultural reasons, taking different views on politics, and we should allow each other the freedom to do that. I think there are moments in history, I mean, Hitler would have been one of them. There are moments in, in history when you see certain virtues being closed down. And the virtues that have been closed down here are, are the, the, the sanctity of the human being. In other words, we are, we are not just objects of pleasure, seeking pleasure. Freedom of speech, we desperately need freedom of speech or we can't tell people about Jesus. We can't tell people that they need... They need to repent in order to find the love of God. Um, and without, without freedom of speech and the sanctity of the individual, uh, both of which are threatened by the cultural movement we have, Christians are in dire trouble. Now, if Christians who are against Brexit feel that they can provide political solutions that keep the sanctity of human beings and keep freedom of speech, then bring it on. Um, because we can go forward together. But they don't and they aren't. And I think my prophetic friend is right. I, I think that, that people ought to do the math, as you say, and discover that the present movement, both in terms of uh, the culture of sexuality and this submission to a global, or rather global is the wrong word, to a, to, a, to a very large political body that has no democratic accountability, is really bad for Christians. It is ironic that uh, you're trying to leave Europe like America tried to leave uh, England not so long ago, <laughs> so many centuries ago. 
But just this week, Rowan Williams said, hey, listen, you know, it's time to to just get rid of this, this um, um, is it 50? Refer- uh, Constitution 50, exit 50, um, and, and maybe have another referendum. And Justin Welby uh, is not happy with how it's going too, and he fears that you know the the uh, European Union will be mad at us, and uh, we we're just not going to be doing this right. Uh, obviously, archbishops and former archbishops are you know still involved in in polity, and uh, you can't look at uh, the Old Testament and New Testament and say there were no politics there. And so clearly, we we have to have an allowance for um, leaders and lay leaders in politics. Um, but my problem is nobody is backing up and using scripture to justify their politics. They're using other things, the, 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 the spirit of the age more than they use scripture. I, I, I think it's hard to use biblical verses to say we have to choose Brexit. I think it's a more complex situation than that. Oh, I agree. Which, which is why what I've tried to do is to say, look, we have two value systems at work. Which one of these value systems will last and be the church better? And I think democratic accountability and freedom of speech are, are, are essential to being the church. You can be the church without it, but, but you have to do it in a totalitarian regime where, where you hide away in the catacombs. And whilst I think that's coming, I'd like to postpone that. I'd like to be able to go out onto the streets and onto YouTube and talk about Jesus and... and uh, the commandments we're supposed to walk in without being ostracized or, or cut off. So I, I don't understand why, for example, Justin Welby, who spoke in the House of Lords the other day, and he said, my diocese doesn't want to be turned into a lorry park. So for the common good, let us not turn my diocese into a lorry park. Let us delay Article 50. And I would like to say to Justin Welby, I agree, it would be horrid to have your diocese turned into a lorry park. This is not a nice thing, no one would want it. On the other hand, your diocese should not be a democratic, free speech, free zone. It's better to have park lorries than to lose those. Why, why can't, why did you see that? Well, some c- people with common sense and a king, no doubt, uh, <laughs> not too long ago, uh, said you know, in this Magna Carta, it's okay to give rights to citizens and allow landowners to have some vote in what happens in polity. And uh, somehow that's been forgotten in England. Do you know, it may, it may be your right. It may be this is essentially a transaction to do with, with power. And one of the reasons why the bishops and the archbishops of the Church of England uh, like it is because they are power brokers. They are the powerful. And power speaks to power. They, they, they're okay. They belong to a group of influential people. They're in power, yeah. Behind the scenes, they're in power. And so, but, but here's the paradox. They keep on saying they're talking up for the powerless. They keep on saying that this is about the common good. But actually, it seems to be about their, 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 their tribal good, their, their narrow collective good, uh, rather, than, rather than the good of the whole people. So I'm, I... It would be nice to even to have a debate about it. But, of course, the present culture won't even allow a debate. Neither the BBC nor the newspapers uh, give people who are pro-freedom of speech and pro-choice democratically a platform to do it. Now, if you are, if you have no ability to communicate, they'll give you the, a complete uh, form to do so. If you're a horrible speaker and you support something they don't support, they'll let you speak and they'll say, this is, see that gobsmock? That's just how they speak. And uh, that's why we don't support the people who uh, uh, want to keep Article 50. That's ridiculous. And so, yeah, they, they do promote the people who are not a, a good voice for a cause. Uh, but if you have an intelligent person, somebody who can uh, dissuade the uh uh, like the climate change uh, arguments going on right now, you know, they won't get a place at all at the BBC. In uh, the same with Christianity. It's the way it is. However, let's not go too far here because um, I see, you know, the news two weeks ago was the uh, representative for the Church of England in Rome uh, or the Anglican Cubian. Is he Church of England or Anglican Cubian? Uh, he's Australian, he's Australian, Anglican Church in Australia. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Well, the the previous guy uh, got canned because he was having trouble with his sexual ethics. They got a new guy. Uh, his name is the very Reverend Doctor John Shepherd, and uh, he's going to be the new Canterbury representative to the Holy See. Uh, Doctor Shepherd has a different opinion than myself on the resurrection. He doesn't believe it happened. He thinks it was a happy fantasy. Um, it, there was no bodily resurrection. It was a kind of spiritual rejuvenation of hope in the imagination of the Christ figure produced by the cerebral cortexes, or the trans something lobe, whatever the physical, physiological manifestation was of the early believers. <clears throat> and consequently, um, it, it's all about inspiration and not about fact. So um, he doesn't believe in the resurrection. And that really means in most people's, in most books, he's not a Christian. You have to Let's be clear to the for the audience here. If there will not, <clears throat> excuse me, the little choked up here. If there was no resurrection, it's all a lie. Everything in Acts on is an absolute lie. If there was no resurrection, if Jesus wasn't resurrected. So you know when he appeared on the road to Emmaus, he didn't appear. It was a happy moment. When when he appeared in the upper room, he didn't appear. When he appeared by the lakeside, he didn't appear. When so, he appeared before Paul, Saul, he didn't. didn't absolutely. Yeah. So the the problem is this: so this man has been made, uh, has been given a very important job. He's essentially uh, the whole of Anglicanism's representative to the Holy See, and. Um, David Old, quite rightly, has discovered a sermon where uh, chapter and verse, he denies the resurrection, and then the question is asked, what is the Archbishop of Canterbury doing having this man as his personal representative to the Pope? Now, uh, Cranmer, uh, the dear blessed uh, Adrian Hilton, has written a, a fulsome defense of Justin Welby, as he often does, in my view, on weaker and weaker ground as the days go by. And, and this one, he says, you mustn't blame the, 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 the CEO of the organization because he delegated this to some of his juniors and they screwed up. So there's no way a, the CEO should have responsibility for the people below him to whom he delegates things screwing up. Uh, that's not a very good principle of management of any organization, but that's the argument put forward. And the reply to that is that if the people who had appointed him, there is a, there is a board, that takes responsibility for it. Uh, if they had thought for a moment that a man with these views was unacceptable, completely unacceptable to the Archbishop of Canterbury, they wouldn't have appointed him. Let's say they were wrong. Let, let's say they made a mistake about that and um, <clears throat> uh, that they, they thought he would be acceptable, but Justin Welby does not find it acceptable. Then of course it would be open to Justin Welby to say, I repudiate either the appointment or at the very least, his views. Has Justin Welby said anything of the kind? Of course he hasn't. Well, in reality, to be successful at this job, all Mr. Shepard has to do is keep his pants on. Because uh, they'll fire you if, you, if you're would, uh, have some sexual issues uh, over in Rome. But uh, it, I don't think the theology here matters. Well, it would be an improvement on the, on the last man. Uh, actually, there'd be many... Well, let us not... Yeah. For medieval Catholic system of comparing sins and making a hierarchy of sin. Let's just say that the ideal Christian virtue is both to keep your pants on and believe in the resurrection. Uh, but, but for him not to believe in the resurrection, sends signals out to the rest of the church, and particularly to the Catholic church, that actually we are a Christian delight organization. Ironically, if Christ was not resurrected, the actions of the previous uh, ambassador to Rome were wrong. <laughs> well, that's just me. So, so, so that's the news we have so far. Anything else you want to cover? No, I, I think it's time for a cup of tea. I think that will cover. When are you heading back to England, if they let you back? <clears throat> um, either, either, either 4 a.m. Sunday morning or 4 a.m. Tuesday morning, uh, d depending on some variables I haven't yet worked out. Make sure that fairy captain listens to you, okay? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that in, in the spirit of good disagreement, he'll get me to the other side. <laughs> All right. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been patiently listening to episode 473 of Anglican Unscripted on the 11th of January 2019. Thank you.